Shalom. This week's Torah portion, Re'eh, begins with the words, See, I present before you today a blessing and a curse. This week's Torah portion is about seeing, and it's about this blessing and curse which are palpable. They are so real. They're standing and waiting for us to make this choice, and they're as real as these two mountains that wit witness them, and it's completely in our hands to make this choice. And this whole parsha is about seeing, and it's about the vision of the program of the people of Israel coming into the land and living according to the principles of this week's Torah portion and of the whole Torah, and erecting the Holy Temple, inheriting the land, and possessing it. And this creates a state of excellence for the entire world. And what is the first thing that we are commanded to do? We read in the beginning of chapter 12, these are the decrees and the ordinances that you shall observe to perform in the land that Hashem, the God of your forefathers, has given you to possess it all the days that you live on the land. You shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations that you are driving away worship their gods, on the high mountains and on the hills and under every leafy tree. You shall break apart their altars, you shall smash their pillars, and their sacred trees shall you burn in the fire. Their carved images shall you cut down, and you shall obliterate their names from that place. And this, essentially, is the way in which we take possession of the land. The first task is to clear the land of all traces of polytheism. This land is to be the land of the one God and His Torah. And we may leave no reminder of any contrary way of looking at the world or of looking at life. Every trace of heathenism must be eradicated. And you shall break apart their altars. This means their form of worship. You shall smash their pillars is a reference to their traditions. And their sacred trees you shall burn in fire refers to their superstitions. In other words, when you come into the land to possess it, destroy the foreign cultures. There's no room here for that. There's no ecumenism. There's no mutual admiration society. There's no humanism. There's no pluralism. There's no deep regard for others or saying that these gods are the same as Hashem. I'm okay. You're okay. We just worship differently. We don't. Here there is no democracy. Here we don't worship death. Or at least we're not supposed to. And the verse continues and states, you shall not do this to Hashem your God. And I'm like, what do you mean? I would have thought that I would break apart Hashem's altar? What does this mean? And so the sages tell us that this is actually full of hi <coughs> hidden meaning. This verse, Rashi tells us, conveys several ideas. One is that you must not make an offering anywhere you want, but only in the place that Hashem will choose, the Holy Temple, which will become your center, your spiritual nucleus. Again, the centrality of that place. But it's also a warning not to erase Hashem's name or even to uproot or damage even one stone from the altar. And the great sage Rabbi Yishmael said, would one ever think that a Jew would uproot a stone from the altar? But rather, he says, it means don't imitate the actions of these nations so that your sins would not cause the sanctuary to be destroyed. The truth is all of these interpretations are spot on. Don't allow the sanctuary to be destroyed through your actions, and don't erase Hashem's name through your actions. But this whole concept that this verse bothers to, to tell us, to intimate, to allude, that one must not uproot a stone from the altar of Hashem in the Holy Temple. Do you think, and I ask you this week, as we read Parshat Re'eh, if one is not allowed to uproot even one stone from the altar, do you think that one would be allowed to uproot a home in the land of Israel? A community? That one would be allowed to uproot the land itself? And what if a prime minister, and perhaps the majority of his cabinet, would tell us that painful decisions have to be made, and that murderers with the blood of our children on their hands must be released for the sake of the nation. Does this not seem to be a total disregard for everything that the God of Israel tells us 
in this week's Torah portion? And is this not an attempt to erase Hashem's name? But the United States commends his courage. But the United States would never release murderers from custody. The United States doesn't even release Jonathan Pollard, whose sole crime was saving Israel from Saddam Hussein. And this week's Torah portion tells us exactly how to behave and how to hold on to Eretz Israel, to the land of Israel. And regarding leaders who push alien agendas, does not this very week's Torah portion warn us? If there should stand up in your midst a prophet, even a prophet, how much less a prime minister, or a dreamer of a dream, like that big deal American dream, and he will produce for you a sign or a wonder, and even if the sign or the wonder comes about, of which he spoke to you saying, let us follow gods of others that you did not know and worship them, worship their cult of death, or worship our own destruction. The verse says, do not listen. Hashem your God is testing you to know whether you love Hashem your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And <clears throat> we continue to read in chapter 12. Rather, only at the place that Hashem your God will choose from among all your tribes to place his name, there shall you seek out his presence and come there. And there shall you bring your burnt offerings and feast offerings, your tithes and what you raise up with your hands, your vow offerings and your free will offerings, and the firstborn of your cattle and your flocks. You shall eat there before Hashem your God, and you shall rejoice with your every undertaking, you and your households, as Hashem your God has blessed you. All your endeavor, everything, the fruit of all of your efforts, comes back to that place. It's part of a program. And the program is totally comprehensive and nurtures and teaches the nation to be so totally sensitive to the sanctity of life and to the absolute unequivocal sanctity of every moment. The whole program is designed to keep the nation and indeed the world on the edge of total focus of life's sanctity. And that is exactly what the world seems to be trying to prevent. The truth is this Parsha details a whole program of sensitivity. The concept of the permitted and forbidden foods which have such an influence on who a person becomes. The concept of the cycle of the year. The experience of the feeling of time. The holidays as they're observed in the Holy Temple. Even the idea of not eating the blood of an animal, but pouring it on the ground and covering it, this is born of our ultimate and unequivocal reverence for life. Do you think that such reverence for life, that the very eating of an animal is bound up with detailed ritual designed to keep us alert and sensitive to the sanctity of life at all times, do you think that such a people that is so cognizant of the sanctity of the life force should consider releasing their own murderers. We do not worship death. Consider these words again in this week's Torah portion. When Hashem your God will cut down the nations to which you come to take possession from them before you and will take possession from, and you will take possession from them and settle in their land, beware for yourselves lest you be attracted after them after they have been destroyed before you. Everything that is an abomination of Hashem that He hates have they done to their gods. For even their sons and their daughters they have burned in the fire for their gods. No. They have burned our sons and daughters in the fire for their gods. Oh, for Moses was pregnant when she was murdered along with her son and her fetus. The murderer was Muhammad Ab Abdul Daoud, who threw a petrol bomb at their car in 1987. He is about to be set freed by Benjamin Netanyahu. Rachel Weiss was burned to death together with her three small children in 1988 when the bus she was riding in was attacked by petrol bombs. The murderer was Mahmoud Abu Sharbish. He is about to be set free by Benjamin Netanyahu. In 1985, Mayor Ben Yair and Michal Cohen were sitting in their car in a forest near Beit Shemesh when they were murdered by Mustafa Ganimat, together with his two terrorist friends. He is about to be set free 
by Benjamin Netanyahu. Leah Almaikas and Yosef Eliyahu were murdered while hiking in a forest on Mount Gilboa. Their murderer was, was Othman Bini Chassin. He is about to be set free by Benjamin Netanyahu. Isa Abid Rabu murdered Ravital Suri and Ron Levy, stabbing them to death. He is about to be set free by Benjamin Netanyahu. One of Israel's leading historians, Professor Menachem Stern, was murdered in 1989, stabbed to death by Mahmoud Isa Muammar in Jerusalem. The terrorist also murdered three other people, and he's about to be set free by Benjamin Netanyahu. The above are just a few names of the murderers of men, women, and children that are about to be set free. And these actions, which would seem to prove to the world that Jewish life is worthless and that the murder does not count, are the very opposites of why the State of Israel was founded. Let us together take this opportunity of the reading this week of Parshat Re'eh to remind the Prime Minister that we do not worship death and that we are enjoined to uphold the sanctity of life. And we shall not stand idly by while the world worships our death. In this very Parsha, it is stated, You are children to Hashem your God. You shall not cut yourselves and you shall not make a bald spot between your eyes for a dead person. And contrary to the voices of self-destruction emanating from within, and contrary perhaps to the position of Saib Arakat or President Obama or anyone else, God continues and tells us at this very moment, this week, Parshat Re'eh, don't get fooled again. For you are children to Hashem your God. For you are a holy people to Hashem your God. And Hashem has chosen you for Himself to be a treasured people from among all the peoples on the face of the earth.